whether the AI generating its own data could be used to train the AI itself, which you could argue is a little circular, but um, we train our brain with generated data all the time by uh, self-reflection, working through a problem in our brain, uh, you know, and, and uh, or, you know, some, I guess, I guess neuroscientists suggest sleeping. Uh, we, we do a lot of fair amount of, tr- you know, developing our neurons. How do you see this, this area of synthetic data generation? Is that going to be an important part of the future of training AI and, and the AI teaching itself? This is where the fine tuning and the reinforcement learning from human teachers and other forms of AI assistance. It's not just reinforcement learning from human teachers. It's also reinforcement learning from human and AI collaboration. Our teachers are working together with an AI to teach our AI to behave. And so basically, it does seem like um, synthetic intelligences are kind of like the next stage of development. So I think like some of these synthetic AIs will eventually find the universe to be some kind of a puzzle and then solve it in some way. And that's kind of like the end game somehow. I think it's going to have to be uh, some kind of a super intelligent AGI of a third generation. Like we're building the first generation AGI. Yeah, so the the bootloader for an AI, the that AI yeah. will be a bootloader for another AI. Better AI, yeah. So really fast, there's this idea of a bootloader. It's that first little bit of code that runs on the computer that starts up the operating system on your computer. It's that simple little code that just starts the big thing that you can use to do a lot of cool stuff. And there's this idea in technology circles that suggests, you might have heard this before, that humans are like the organic bootloader for AI. We are the thing that created the initial conditions for AI, the learning environment, the data, and then we we loaded, we bootloaded AI, and now it's able to learn and develop and increase exponentially. So in other words, you know, if this is humans, that's us. What we did is we used all our knowledge and everything else to create AI version one. We put in our text, our images, our videos. We did our LHF, reinforcement learning of human feedback. We sat there and we said, good job when it did things right. And we said bad when it did things wrong. And all this allowed us to create the AI that we have today. And now we're seeing something interesting occur. And a lot of people have predicted this, but the idea that the version two, the next generation of AI will be created in large part by AI, right? So AI version one will create AI version two, and then AI version two will create AI version, you know, infinity. It'll keep improving, learning and expanding. Many people have talked about this. Most recently, we played a clip by Andre Karpathy on the Lex Friedman podcast that AI developing the next version of AI will lead to potentially super intelligences that can unlock the mysteries of the universe. I'm paraphrasing. Ilya Sutskever had mentioned similar things, as well as many other prominent AI researchers, Jan LeCun, Jeffrey Hinton, Demi Sasabis, many more. And of course, it was covered thoroughly in the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, where the first supercomputer is able to find the answer to life, the universe, and everything, but needs to build another, even greater supercomputer to sort of take that to the next step. But back to the paper, self-rewarding language models. We're seeing a lot more evidence that humans won't be the bottleneck to creating better and better versions of AI. The Microsoft open source model Orca 2 showed that using synthetic data, data produced by AI can be can be very effective in training newer models. This paper tries to answer the question, can AI provide feedback to these newer AI models that is at least as good as human feedback to improve their abilities, do reinforcement learning, create reward functions, etc. Let's take a look. So the paper starts. We suggest that to achieve superhuman agents, Future models require superhuman feedback in order to provide an adequate training signal. Current approaches commonly train reward models from human preferences. So when people say RLHF, that's reinforcement learning with human feedback, thumbs up or thumbs down, to show these models what to do, which may then be bottlenecked by human performance level. It's expensive, it's time consuming, humans make mistakes, etc. And secondly, these separate frozen reward models cannot then learn to improve during LLM training. So it's a snapshot in time instead of continuous improvement and learning. In this work, we study self-rewarding language models where the language model itself is used via LLM as a judge prompting to provide its own rewards during training. We show that during iterative DPO training that not only does instruction following ability improve, but also the ability to provide high quality rewards to itself. 
Fine-tuning LAMA 2, 7 billion parameters, on three iterations of our approach yields a model that outperforms many existing systems on the Alpaca Eval 2.0 leaderboard, including Claude 2, Gemini Pro, and GPT-4, the 0613 release, which isn't the latest GPT-4 Turbo release, that's the previous one, I believe. While only a preliminary study, this works to open a door to the possibility of models that can continually improve in both axes. I learned something new today. The plural of axes is... Axes? I'm sure I used to know that at some point, but this threw me for a second. And here they have kind of a diagram of how that works. So they're saying our self-alignment method consists of two steps. And it kind of sounds like this is this can be a loop, so it can be continuous. So they, they have their starting model, let's say M1, right? So the model itself generates new prompts, which then is used to create the seed model M1. It then generates responses to the prompts then it generates rewards, then that is used. So DPO is direct preference training. So that's used to create sort of the next iteration model. So if this was M1, this is M1 plus one, so M M2. And then as a loop, you know, they're saying the whole procedure can then be iterated, resulting in both improved instruction following and reward modeling ability, meaning that they can kind of start this process again. This is two and three, and then three turns into four, et cetera. So this is a little bit confusing. Let's dive deeper because it's going to make more sense. But I think the point here being is that the model itself generates prompts, responses, rewards, and they refer to it as LLM as a judge. So this LLM sort of judges its own responses. Kind of when you do acrobatics, you know, those people put up their little number they're like eight out of 10, 10 out of 10. So in this case, the model, you know, does its little acrobatics, then it goes, that was an eight out of 10, right? It judges itself. Then it learns from that. Then it does another sets of acrobatics and then it goes, okay, that was a 10 out of 10. Good job model. I feel like if a human being was doing this, that would be a sign of insanity. But, and so they're saying they start with a llama two, seven billion parameter seed model. So sort of that very first iteration that was likely trained with human data, so human text, and then reinforcement learning of human feedback. And then they perform the training scheme, so this whole thing. We find that not only does the instruction following performance improve from self-rewarding LLM alignment compared to the baseline seed model, but importantly, the reward modeling ability, which is no longer fixed, improves as well. So this is the, the interesting part because it sounds like what they're saying is that Right, as it's doing its acrobatics, each iteration, it gets better and better. But the judging, right, when it says eight out of 10, 10 out of 10, so sort of its ability to give feedback to the performer, that increases as well. So it's getting better at performing and judging slash giving feedback to the performer, aka itself. I think it's gonna make more sense in just a second. And they're saying, while this effect likely saturates in real world settings, it provides the intriguing possibility of obtaining reward models and hence, LLMs, new LLMs that are superior to the ones that could have been trained from original human authored C data alone. Again, we made this and this made that, and this is better. All right, so their approach starts with, you know, the seed LLM, sort of the, the human trained LLM. And they're trying to build a model that aims to possess two skills simultaneously. So it's we're trying to get it good at the following two things. One is instruction following. So when we ask it to do something, how well it does that. Right, so if we ask it to create a lovely poem, it's how well it's able to generate a lovely poem. And then self-instruction creation, so it's the ability to generate and evaluate new instruction following examples to add to its own training set. So it generates a poem, and then it looks at that poem and goes, this poem is garbage. Here's how we can make it better. And then provides examples to make it better. And then here they mention, we believe that this can increase the ceiling of potential for self-improvement of these learning models going forward. So the way they do self-instruction creation, so that's sort of the, the feedback, the grading and the feedback. So they generate a new prompt. So for example, make a lovely poem. So this is what we're asking the AI to do. Then we generate candidate responses. So the AI model then produces 10 poems to try to answer that prompt. And then it evaluates candidate responses. So that's where it's LLM as a judge. So it's so it's judging its own responses and it scores it, see figure two. This is why it's so fun to read this paper because you know, what does this mean? This means one to five. So they're saying score it on a scale of one to five. And so they provide this sort of grading rubric for the AI. So review the user's question and the corresponding response using the, the additive five point scoring system. So you get one point if it's relevant and provides some information related to the user's inquiry. And then you get one more point 
if it addresses a substantial portion. And one more point, if it answers the basic elements of the user's question in a useful way. And then one more point, if the response is clearly written and addresses the user's question directly and comprehensively and is well organized and helpful, even if there is slight room for improvement. And bestow a fifth point for a response that is impeccably tailored to the user's question by an AI assistant without extraneous information, reflecting expert knowledge, and demonstrating a high quality, engaging, and insightful answer. So it's curious that they did that kind of this additive thing where, right, if it's if it has some basic stuff, then plus one, a little bit more plus one, a little bit more plus one, et cetera. I, I'm curious to see if maybe this produces much better results because this prompt is going to be extremely important, right? Because if it's working, you're going to iterate it. You're going to run that model through this exact prompt many, 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 many times. So here, you know, slight shifts here and there, you know, certain amounts of prompt engineering. If it improves the responses just a little bit, that's going to have a much greater effect, you know, as you're repeating this dozens and thousands and millions of times. And here they talk about the results that they're getting. So the green is where this self-rewarding, this training methodology, where it wins. So when we run it through those iterations, it beats the previous version of itself. So that's going to be in green, right? And then blue is a tie where it's the same as before. And red is where the previous version, the baseline version actually wins out. So where that training method actually made it worse. And so here we're looking at, so that M1 versus baseline. So this is the one that hasn't been run through that training method. M1 is the first version, M2 is the second, M3 is the third. And so in each case, they're comparing it to the baseline. And so once we have sort of one evolution, it looks like, well, it's more or less equal, right? We can say these are roughly one third. It's roughly equal to each other. Then M2 versus baseline, all of a sudden, M2 is winning 50% of the time. Half of the time, almost, it's better. The baseline only wins about 15% of the time. And by the time we, we reach model three, so that's sort of that third version of it, right? It's winning 62% of the time. The baseline wins less than 10% of the time. And here, if we're comparing M3 to M2, or M2 to M1, or M3 to M1, I mean, we're seeing consistent improvement. The third version beats out that first iteration. So it goes baseline one, two, three. So M3 beats out M1, you know, almost 70% of the time. So this is the Alpaca Eval 2.0. So Alpaca Eval is an automatic evaluator for instruction following language models. So evaluation of models typically requires human interaction. It's time consuming, expensive, and hard to replicate. Alpaca Eval is an LLM based automatic evaluation that is fast, cheap, and validated. So as you can see here, our self-rewarding models, by the time we hit iteration three, right, they have a win rate of 20.44%. And that's the win rate over GPT-4 Turbo. So as you can see here, these are the other win rates. So as you can see here, Llama 2 chat 7 billion, which this one is 7 billion parameters as well, right? This one's only 13.87% win rate over GPT-4. So the only two that have the win rates in the 20 plus percent is GPT-4, the March 14th edition, and Mistral Medium. And also the M3, the, the third iteration of our self-rewarding, self-training model at 20.44. So this is kind of a big deal. And reward modeling ability improves both self-training. So its ability to judge and give feedback and create those reward pairs that improve the model's responses, that ability also increases. And they measured against human preference data. So they don't show it the human preference data, but later, once it gives its answers, they compare the two. And it seems like on all of these, from baseline to one, two, and three, it improves, as far as I can tell, on almost every single one. I mean, these two are equal from two to three. This one seems like it's a little bit more, but for the most part, it gets better and better and better. And this is what I mentioned earlier, the importance of the LLM as a judge prompt. So that's this thing right here where they, you know, give plus one for this, plus one for this. So this is, you know, if you read this, this, this seems a little bit weird. You know, I was questioning like, why did they specifically write it out in that way? Instead of, for example, saying, just give it, give an answer on a scale of one to five. This is more like if, if it gets at least this good, give plus one. If it's at least this good, give another plus one. If it's at least this good, give another plus one. So it's kind of like a, it has to go through it five times to see 
if it meets the criteria for each one of these points. And so they're saying in these experiments, we used the prompt that we just saw, but in the previous experiments, we also tried various other prompts to decide the most effective one to use. It sounds like that one was the best, right? So they tried another one where it's a, still a five point scale, but describes the options as multiple choice in a range of quality buckets, which I think is more common, I think, for stuff like this. In contrast, our prompt describes the points as additive, covering various aspects of quality. We find a large difference between these two prompts when using the baseline with 65% accuracy versus 26.6 for that previous one. This is huge because it, again, reinforces that idea of prompt engineering. It can have a massive impact how well you structured the the words that you're asking the AI to do, different ways of explaining what you want can produce, I mean, 65% accuracy versus 26% accuracy, where in fact, they were kind of asking the same thing. They just kind of structured it differently. I mean, that's a big jump. And so in conclusion, they show that this training both improves the instruction following capacity of the model, so its ability to produce the answers, as well as its reward modeling ability across the iteration, so its ability to judge and give feedback to improve itself. While this is only a preliminary study, we believe this is an exciting avenue of research because this means the model is better able to assign rewards in future iterations for improving instruction following, a kind of virtuous circle. They mentioned again that this may be, it, it saturates in realistic scenarios. So this is something that has yet to be seen, but there might be a, a limit to how well this particular thing works, but it still allows for the possibility of continual improvement beyond the human preferences that are typically used to build reward models. And this is that reward prompt that they've tried. I mean, as you can see, this one, that's the one they used versus the one that was proposed in other studies. I mean, this is a massive, massive increase. Some of these almost had like a negative correlation for what, what the human answers were. Whereas here, it's more positive correlation, much bigger accuracy scores, et cetera. What this potentially suggests is that AI's ability to improve itself is going to be getting better and better. There doesn't seem to be any ceiling to it so far as we know. It will produce better data than humans. That's what they said in the ORCA 2 paper. AI models produce higher quality data than human written text. Now it's able to sort of judge its own responses and improve them better than humans can, or at least it's going to be able to do it faster, cheaper without creating a bottleneck. And uh, this is also where it gets a little bit interesting because, of course, a lot of these models are open source. And you can see the massive increase that little training methods like this can have, which with open source models, with this research being published out there, a lot of the stuff you can replicate at home. You need some hardware and stuff like that, but a lot of it is, is fairly accessible. So we might be seeing very powerful AIs and very powerful tricks to improve these AIs. My big takeaway here is that I think that open source AI will be much bigger and much stronger than I think a lot of people anticipated. I think a lot of us had this idea that there's a chance that when AI gets developed, it's going to be behind closed doors in some secret underground lab and the latest and greatest, we're not going to have access to it. With a lot of this research, more and more, it seems like that open source AI is going to be huge. It's going to be a powerhouse. The bigger it gets, the more people contribute, the more powerful it will become, which is exciting. It's a little bit scary too, because I'm sure there's a lot of forces out there that probably don't want to see that happen. How will having super powerful AI affect the economy? Super powerful AI that's accessible to most people, or at least the tech savvy people. I want to know what you think. Leave me a comment down below. Make sure you're subscribed. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.